ASRock's doing that thing again that they do with small form factor PCs, which we like to cover. This is the ASRock desk meet. 128 gigabytes of memory, 16, 20 terabytes of disk space, up to 20 terabytes. Look at a 16 terabyte disk here, three and a half inch mechanical hard drive, four terabytes of flash in an NVMe format in just eight liters. ASRock has done it again. This is ASRock's answer to the Intel NUC and I like it better than the Intel NUC. <laughs> Screws and rubber feet, all right. That looks like a normal SATA cable. Totally normal. The quick installation guide for the Deskmeet B660. Yes, this is a B660 motherboard. It's socketed and we're gonna be using CPUs on it. The thing that this system has though is it's not for overclocking. It's not for K series SKUs. And if you look at the specifications, you know, it has a 500 watt power supply but if you look at the supported CPUs, it's 65 watt CPUs. Uh, 65 watts is the TDP number. It's not the power consumed number. The power consumed number is much, much higher, I assure you. This thing will work with a 12900, a 12700, 12500, 12400, a lowly 12100 to core i3, four Alder Lake P cores. That's all we really need. I think I'd probably recommend the 12400, but I got this for $80 on sale, which I couldn't really pass up. I don't even know why I need it, but this is an awesome little machine, not just for desktop computing. We'll, we'll go over alternative uses at the end of the video, but let's take a look. Huh. It's another SATA cable in the box. There it is. I hope it's upside down. There it is. It's so tiny and yet not dramatically larger than an older model desk mini, but this is the desk meat. Where's the beef? Right here, as a matter of fact. That's it, there's, there's no power brick, there's no thing that this thing needs to run from. No, it takes a normal power supply, normal-ish. It's an ATX power supply compatible, sure, but it'll also work with an SFX power supply. And now we need to get it apart. Ah, right there, screw in the bottom. Boom. It comes with a channel well technology, 500 watt max, full size ATX power supply. And then look at that, B660 ITX right there, this motherboard. The case is so tiny. This is a motherboard specific for this case because you've got the cutout on the front for the USB, the five USB ports on the front plus one type C. So instead of having headers, they just went ahead and put the ports right on the front. This is also the maximum length of a GPU that you can install, which is 200 millimeters. There's room enough for a fan on the bottom. You could even do a 140 millimeter AIO if you want, but with these Intel builds like this 12100, it comes with a boxed cooler. All of the non-K processors come with a reasonable box cooler. Uh, the i3 in particular comes with the Laminar uh, RM1, I think, which is the same as the i5-12400. In general, I think the i5-12400 with its 6P cores is my more general overall recommendation. If you shop around, you probably can find it for less than $200. That's a steal for that many Alder Lake P cores. Of course, if you, if you move up to one of the other variants, that's fine. The 12700 would also make sense in here. I don't think the 12900, even the non-K version, necessarily makes sense in here, although you could run it. But the 12700 is gonna run a little bit better. It comes with the box cooler. It's basically everything you need. There are two M.2 ports, one in the front, one in the rear. There's a third M.2 port just for your Wi-Fi. And then, of course, the, uh, you know, the, the I.O. cover at the back is removable, so theoretically, ASRock could offer upgrade motherboards at some point in the future. For onboard, we have VGA because this system is targeted at business users. Like if you just need a relatively powerful business desktop, this would get the job done. DisplayPort and HDMI. Another factor on this motherboard that I really, really like is highly unusual, four DIMM slots. You can rock 128 gigabytes of memory in this form factor. This case also supports mounting up to two three and a half inch hard drives, although one mounts here in the bottom, you'd give up your GPU if you wanted to run a just discrete GPU, but you could run your three and a half inch mechanical hard drive in the front here. So in this form factor, 20 terabytes of mechanical storage, you can do it.
This motherboard is a DDR4 version, so I can use DDR4 memory with this, not DDR5. I've even got a little bit of cable management here at the back. It's just so cute. Let's take a closer look at our drive mounting options. Here's the ye oldie mechanical hard drive. There's one three and a half inch mechanical mounting option and it does not impede our GPU. Speaking of which, let's unbox it so you get an idea of how much physical room we have. This is the Challenger 6400, the AMD Radeon 6400. Now, reviewers haven't really liked the 6400 and 6500 for what they're built on, but I actually kind of like it. And in this build, because we're going to have a PCI Express 4.0 connection, it's like PCI Express 3.0 by 8 worth of bandwidth. We've only got two outputs on this, and this will still make a pretty reasonable 1080p gaming machine. It's certainly dramatically better than the iGPU in the, uh, the Intel, the i3, or the i5. So 200 millimeters of clearance is what we have in the case, and that is more than enough for this. You can see from the test fit here that we have plenty of room for our mechanical hard drive and because of the way the cutouts are on our case, see this is going to fit kind of like this, the cutouts here and here, you actually have a lot of room for your GPU to breathe. <laughs> so if you can see kind of like this, tons and tons of room for that GPU to be able to breathe. It's going to pull air in and exhaust the hot air out the outside. It's pretty genius, really. And this is going to be at the top of the case when it's sitting on your desk. It'll be like that. So, whoosh, whoosh. It's good stuff. Now, if you don't want to rock a three and a half inch mechanical hard drive, that's okay. It is 2022, the time that I'm filming this video anyway. You don't have to rock a three and a half inch mechanical hard drive. If you don't, then you've got room for two two and a half inch bays in the same area. So in this case, I've mounted two two and a half inch, four terabyte Samsung hard drives, Samsung SSDs here. And I still have my two M.2 slots free for other storage. It's madness. Now, what if you've got a bigger GPU? What if you want to opt for something like the Phantom Gaming 6500? That won't fit. This is 210 millimeters, give or take. You've only got 200 millimeters of room to work with in this case. So you've also only got a 500 watt power supply. So keep that in mind. Although. This would be fine with the power supply, but physically, not so much. I mean, you could get creative with a milling machine and probably make it work, but don't do that. Don't do it. Now, if you pick this up, it's sort of up to you to build your system, but it's like painting by numbers. It really is pretty easy, especially when they give you almost everything you need. What you would need is storage, processor, and memory, and maybe a GPU if you don't want to use the integrated GPU. Uh, you can buy an Intel processor that doesn't have a built-in GPU, those are usually denoted with a letter after the number, um, like uh, F as in Fred. F means no onboard GPU, but it's useful to have an onboard GPU because you get quick sync, which you can use for video decoding and encoding. It's useful for streaming. There's a lot of things you can use quick sync for, even if you have a discrete GPU. So even though I'm going to add a GPU in, we can toggle a BIOS setting on and still have the onboard graphics. I still have the onboard graphics that works correctly. Now, these, the Intel Laminar 1, um, the things around the edge here, that, that's just plastic. It's just there to look cool. It doesn't actually do anything. This heat sink is really like super thin. Ugh. It's fine. It's fine. It's also pre-thermal pasted, so you don't have to apply your own thermal paste. It's already on the CPU cooler. You just have to align it and then press the buttons. And you want to do opposite corners at the same time. So like push these in until they click and then push those in until they click. And then it should be sitting pretty evenly. If you look at it from the edge, it should look pretty good in terms of evenness. It shouldn't be sitting like this. It should be flat. Otherwise it's not going to cool properly. And then you plug in, you plug in the CPU fan into the CPU fan header. Now your power supply is also going to mount right here. So it's going to be breathing on the CPU. There's not a lot of room for fancy CPU coolers. If you give up your GPU slot, you can use a 140 millimeter AIO in the bottom, but eh, which is really the top. So the radiator would be a radiator. The radiator would be up here at the top and the pump down here at the bottom because this is the normal 
orientation. So the motherboard's kind of upside down from what we're used to. So now that we got our CPU mounted, the next thing is to mount our storage and memory. And I'm not entirely sure what we're gonna use for storage. Okay, for memory and storage, storage is pretty pedestrian. I'm going with a one terabyte Intel 760p. <laughs> this SSD is okay. The great thing about this SSD is that usually it's pretty inexpensive and it's fairly well engineered because it's Intel. It works pretty well with the RST drivers. This is an Intel native platform. It's definitely not the fastest one terabyte drive out there. In fact, there's a lot of drives that are faster, but the performance of this drive is pretty consistent even as it fills up, even though it's triple level cells. So not bad. Could mount it on the back of the motherboard or the top. I'm gonna mount it on the top of the motherboard to leave the back open for future expansion because I think it's gonna be a little easier to get to the back. If I thought I was gonna change the SSD at some point in the future, I'd probably worry about the back. It's also worth pointing out that this motherboard doesn't have any thermal solution for your M.2. So depending on what M.2 you buy, you may wanna use the bundled thermal solution for it. The 760p, it doesn't try real hard, so it doesn't get super hot. It'll be fine without the thermal solution. Now I've said it once before, but it bears repeating. This is the only platform that I know of that's this big that supports 128 gigabytes of memory. This OLOY kit is 64 gigabytes, it's 232 gig DIMMs. If I put all four in here, this would be a 128 gigabyte configuration. The other reason I picked the OLOY memory that has wings is because the, the clearance on these, this set of memory is ridiculous. It's absolutely bananas, it's nuts. They should have never released it in this configuration. And in fact, the later versions of this uh, memory tone this down. But it's to demonstrate the superior memory clearance of this case as well, even when we're rocking the standard ATX power supply. We still have an M.2 slot that's free, another M.2 slot that's just for the Wi-Fi, so it's short three SATA connections, an extra USB 2.0 header on the motherboard in case you cram some kind of accessory in here that needs a USB 2 header. It's there. This is ridiculous in the best possible way. Now this is an ATX power supply. This is an SFXL power supply and a regular SFX power supply is even shorter. It's the same size, it's just cut a little short. This case will work with either. So we can mount this in there and have a little bit more room for CPU cooler clearance. Noctua has some nice low profile CPU coolers. If you feel like that's holding you back, then by all means, swap out the power supply. However, it's unnecessary. This is a reasonable power supply and it's a standard power supply. And even with that, we've still got about almost a centimeter clearance between our CPU fan and the, uh, the fan in the power supply. Now the power supply fan is actually gonna help us cool our VRM area so that we've got lots and lots of airflow around the VRM, which I greatly appreciate. And just to show you, just to give you an idea, even with our ATX power supply in there, uh, let's see this way, it's going to clear the memory because the power supply ends before the memory begins. So the, the memory could be even taller than it is here and it would be completely fine. It's, I mean, it's very unusual to have a system this small that's this easy to work on, even in all these different permutations. All right, when we're ready to mount our power supply for real, we need to unbundle the cables. Oh, it's multicolored cables. Everybody always likes all black cables. You know, it's fine. Looks like we got two SATA device cables, one eight pin GPU power cable. So if you're gonna cram a GPU in here that has two power connectors, not gonna work, 500 watts, that'll give you the connector for it one eight pin CPU power, and then your standard 24 pin connector for your motherboard. And they are short. As you're assembling the system, you wanna make sure that the fans, uh, you know, the CPU fan is clear. You wanna look in this way, and make sure that the, the, the power supply cables are not like wedged between your CPU fan and the power supply. It's just something to watch out for when you're doing a build. I'm not saying you don't know what you're doing, but you never know. <laughs> And then our cute little GPU, 6400. Oh, it's so cute with its HDMI and its display port. It's only two outputs. It's so cute. It doesn't even need power. It gets all its power through the PCIe slot. That's it. All right, let's peel and stick our feet. Get the screw on and be good to go. You must peel and stick the feet because there's a screw on the bottom that's not recessed. It'll scratch your table otherwise. Plus also it breathes a little bit at the bottom here, just a little bit. 
definitely don't put it on carpet. This screw on the bottom locks it. If you are planning to use this in a business installation or you need a security bit, there is a security lock here. There's a tab at the bottom and you can also replace the Phillips screw with a security bit. Between those two things, it's unlikely anybody's gonna be doing anything bad with your desk meat. Yeah, listen to that heft. That's got some meat on its bones. All right, let's get our operating system installed and do some level one diagnostics. Well, the results are in. And there's a lot to love about ASRock's eight liter desk meat form factor. They really put the meat in the desk meat with its arms and that sort of fun stuff. The RX 6400, it's not bad. You can get 60 FPS at medium low settings on a lot of games. But uh, I upgraded to a 6600. Yes, you can get the Challenger ITX on an RX 6600 variety, and that's more like 120 FPS at 1080p. Well, it depends on the game. But uh, it's, a, it's a much better experience. Had a lot of fun playing Doom. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But this thing, 8 liters, a 16 terabyte mechanical hard drive, or even a 20 terabyte mechanical hard drive, plus two M.2 slots in this form factor. You get two 5 gigabit ports on the front, two... USB 2.0 ports, plus a USB Type-C, plus headphones with the rear I.O. It's almost, but not quite, a completely standard ITX form factor. When you run Cinebench, you see what you're really giving up, and it's really the difference between K and non-K. You see, it's, a, it's a sort of a fun situation with these Intel CPUs because of the competition in the market. If you get a K-series Intel CPU, even if you're not overclocking, as long as you can manage power delivery and thermals, those CPUs will run at their highest specification indefinitely. When you run Cinebench on the desk meet, uh, at first it's going to use about, well, it'll burst to 117 watts with, say, the i5-12400. That's six Alder Lake P-Cores. 117 watts for that CPU. But after a while, it'll back off to about 90 watts, and it's 90 watts all-core sustained in Cinebench, and that'll score just about 12,000 on our Cinebench R23 benchmark. But after a little bit longer, it'll drop down to 65 watts. And the Alder Lake CPU cores are actually surprisingly power efficient in these non-K parts. It's just that the K parts have been binned such that you can dump a lot more power into them. 30, 35% more power might be like seven or 8% more performance. That's what Intel needs for the edge. If you're not concerned about having a fire breathing monster on your desk, this is still an incredible level of performance for much less power and much less heat generation. In fact, I got out the FLIR thermal imager just so we could take a look at what we're working with in terms of thermal imaging. And it breathes shockingly well. We've got the vents at the top and side for the GPU, and we also have the vent on the bottom for the VRM. And the vent at the bottom is by far the hottest when we're running benchmarks like Cinebench. When we're running games, it's really a pretty evenly distributed system. The total wattage used by the system while gaming is considerably higher than when we're running a benchmark like Cinebench. And so our VRM temperatures would get up to about 87 degrees C, our CPU temperature would get up to about 83, and that's with that relatively modest laminar RM1 Intel box cooler. Also with our uh, i5-12400, I'm not even rocking the i3, the i3 is four Alder Lake core, so it's even less of an issue thermally. This thing can handle the i7 no problem. I mean, okay, I guess technically you could put the i9-12900 non-K in this thing, but I wouldn't really recommend it. The 16 cores are more for like the all-core performance junkie, and in that case you're better off moving up to a desktop anyway, because even if you're not going to overclock, you get that all-core performance that the K gives you as long as you can manage power and thermals. It's really important to understand that. But for the i7, a bursty workload, gaming workloads, mixed-use workloads, 12 cores, 8 Alder Lake P cores, plus 4 efficiency cores, that still works pretty well in this platform. Yes, a K-series CPU will be higher performance and higher sustained performance. That i7 is going to back off to 65 watts. Just like we saw with our i5-12400, the i5-12400 really is the sweet spot where you're not really giving up much at all in terms of performance. I mean, on a desktop board, you could maybe get just over 12,000, maybe with faster memory or DDR5, but right at 12,000 on this thing is definitely nothing to sneeze at. And of course, with the Challenger ITX RX 6400, there's no bottleneck there. 
even upgrading to the 6600, which you can do. I mean, it's a 200 millimeter maximum length for your GPU, and the RX 6600 in this platform makes it a pretty decent gaming machine. I mean, over 100 FPS in most titles. Even at very high settings in Doom Eternal, we're regularly going into the 90 FPS range at 1080p, and it's a very enjoyable, very responsive, very snappy gaming experience. But you can still get a lot of work done because, hey, this platform, 128 gigabytes of RAM, 20 terabytes of mechanical storage, competent gaming, and an eight liter package. This is what Intel needs to be looking at for their NUC form factor. I mean, or like the higher end of NUC, like the Beast Canyon sort of NUCs. And this is really clever too because it doesn't require a riser card or add-ins or anything like that. It's an ITX-ish form factor with a GPU. The motherboard's extended out the front, uh, so it's a little bit longer of a motherboard than standard ITX so that you can get the front panel USB connectors without having any, any cables or any extra anything. But it's a standard power supply, which is nice for being able to work on it. It's got plenty of clearance around the memory. It's got plenty of clearance in it. If you wanted to run two, two and a half inch you know, SATA hard drives, you totally can do that. If you want to replace the standard power supply with an SFX power supply, you can totally do that. So it's going to be easy to work on and have standard parts from now until the end of time, which is great, even though it's a small form factor system. And so maybe ITX form factor GPUs will also come back in vogue, but very well done, very well engineered, a lot of lessons learned. You can tell that ASRock is paying attention to what their customers want from working on systems like the Desk Mini as far back as this. And they're just like, okay, well, you want the Desk Mini, but you don't really want to give up flexibility and upgradability. Boom, the Desk Meat has got the meat. So, good job, ASRock. I'm Wendell, this is Level One. This has been a quick look at the Desk Meat and my fun adventure sort of building with it. And again, you know, it's just, it's a surprising platform all around. I'm surprised how good it is. All right, I'm signing out and you can find me in the level one forums. Oh, and if you're thinking, hey, this might actually be a good platform for a forbidden home server with dual redundant two and a half inch uh, storage and maybe a four port NIC and maybe running some of those Alder Lake P cores for uh, virtual machines and some other off label uses. Well, I'm thinking the same thing, but that's gonna have to be in another video. All right, I'm signing out and I'll see you in the forums.